everybody. Welcome back to Little Man Big Conversations. Thank you all for coming back to join us on this illustrious podcast. The history of this podcast so far, we've interviewed various entertainers, a lot of pro wrestlers, a lot of actors, a lot of villas performers. But hey, this one I've got today, man, this one has been in the works for quite some time. I couldn't reveal anything. There may have been an NDA, may not have been. Who knows? I'm not at liberty to say. But wait no longer because he is here today. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my esteemed honor to present to you today one of Australia's finest entertainers, comedy writers, and entertainers as well. Hell, he's a great entertainer, he's a great comedian, and he's even a better person. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to proudly introduce to you from The Chaser, Mr. Andrew Hansen. Andrew, how are you, man? Hello, LJ. I'm just, just finishing off that uh, <clears throat> very lengthy contract uh, that you and I were <laughs> <clears throat> negotiating over the last 14 years, uh, but I think it's all signed and we're, and we're all good to go. Great. I'm just actually, uh, before you rang, I was just finishing up The Secret, so it actually works out to be great. Oh, well, you'll be a very successful and wealthy person. You don't need to run a podcast anymore. I imagine <laughs> your life is, is perfect if you've read that book. Oh, I, can't wait for, I can't wait to buy the third one, The Magic. Uh, <laughs> this is, uh, I, I must say, straight off the bat, uh, this is an absolute dream for me. I mean, I don't want to blow too much smoke, oh. but uh, I, I do want to say that... Uh, before we started, before we started recording, this is—I uh, mentioned to you that this is an absolute uh, pleasure. I mean, I, I I pinched myself this morning knowing that this was happening, and uh, I was asked to leave the library, so I, I I left very quickly because they thought I was on some sort of medication. Um, yeah, don't be pinching you know, yourself in a public in a public <laughs> space, don't you? <laughs> Neurofen's a hell of a drug, and but this is this is this is quite. Um, quite an honor i mean i grew up like many australians and, and many people worldwide that saw uh most arguably your most popular work at that time of the chasers war and everything and i fell in love with that show i tuned in religiously every every day or every week that it was on and to know that you're here now and i'm speaking to you is is just an absolute blast so again thank you so much for your time today andrew this is just this is, this is great. We haven't even started, and this is already amazing. Oh, man, this is a very fl flattering and nice introduction, LJ. I, I don't normally get such such lovely introductions. I, I normally get, uh, you know, something like, uh, uh, get ready, everybody. It's Chaz Lichardello from The the Chasers uh, or something like that. You know, I, I, they normally don't even tell us apart. <laughs> Now, normally, the way I begin this podcast is that I have sort of a connection or a history with uh, – the person I'm interviewing. Uh, this is this is the first time where I don't have a background, but I did come and see your latest stand up as of this recording, which is Andrew Hansen is cheap, and I had the absolute honor of uh, meeting you after the show, and you were so kind and so gracious, and the show was. Uh, I mean, I still quote the show to this day to my friends that I went with. So uh, this is that was it was fantastic. But so before we get into the history of you. Um, I kind of want to start, sort of Tarantino it, if you will, and start where we are now. Ooh, um, uh, in the middle of things, all right. Yes. In regards to the Andrew Hansen is cheap stand-up, what was the, besides the tongue-in-cheek name, if you will, what was the sort of ideology behind getting back on stage and doing stand-up, you know, the solo stand-up shows again? Yeah, it was something that I kind of realised I should have been doing all along, you know, I mean, and, and, but I never had a manager <clears throat> until recently to point out to me and say, oh, look, Andrew, you know, it would be quite normal if you were making comedy <laughs> shows on TV. You should probably also be touring some live shows as well. And then, you know, mm -hmm. then you can sort of make some more money and, and it build your profile and things like that, which I it never really occurred to me. I sort of thought, oh, well, I saw other people doing it and it, it never struck me that I should probably do the same. Um, I mean, I had done you know, quite a bit of live theatre when I was a student at mm. uni. And then uh, we did do some live shows with The Chaser. Uh, you know, we t we toured a couple of times and I had a lot of fun doing that. And, okay, I did a lot of corporate stuff. So the, the live performances that I was doing was real sellout stuff, you know, like mm. emceeing people's corporate annual events and that sort of stuff um, and and trying to amuse the, the corporate crowd. Um, but then, uh, yeah, it, it occurred to me like in about tw – it was early 2020, so terrible, terrible timing. I decided, <laughs> right, Great. now I'm going to go really big on the live circuit. I think, I think why don't I start touring um, as often as I can with, you know, maybe ideally bring out a, 
a fresh new comedy show every year or two. And, uh, you know, of course, then, then that, that first tour, like everybody else's tours, that were completely derailed <laughs> yeah. in 2020. <laughs> um, and then, uh, you know, so then I was able to properly tour a show in 2022, which was called Everyone Else is Wrong. <clears throat> which was kind of, that felt to me a bit of a, a zeitgeist of 2022. You know, we'd come out of this pandemic and everybody was an expert. Everybody thought they knew everything and everybody was convinced that everyone else was wrong and mm -hmm. only they were correct. So that was the idea of that show. And then Andrew Hansen is cheap. It was my 2023 show. I, I noticed at the end of 2022 that there was a lot of talk about things becoming extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, why don't I? just make the show about that, you know, okay. make a comedy show about how bloody unaffordable everything is, um, which is kind of, I mean, it was a, it's a loose theme. I don't, I don't know if you do this in, in, in your work, LJ, but um, mm. it's, it's good to have an engine or a, or a theme or, a, you know, some sort of story that drives the show because it makes it feel a bit more meaty and it makes it feel like a little bit more meaningful. But in the end, I guess it is ultimately a collection of, separate little comedy bits about all kinds of different subjects, which I sort of shoehorn into the theme. You know, mm. I mean, and it's not as if every single sketch and song that I put into Andrew Hansen is cheap was really about saving money, but um, yeah, I, I can kind of twist it and, and make it seem that way. So that if it's a, a, a sketch about <clears throat> being a dad with very young children, for example, and what that's like, I can sell it as, Oh, um, Gee, it's hard to afford having kids these days, isn't it? They're very expensive to raise. And then, then I can do a sketch about, you know, the fact that kids wake up too early in the morning and how difficult is th that is. So, so that that was the that was the theme for Andrew Hansen is cheap. And I mean, luckily it did become true. Luckily, you know, everything did become unbelievably expensive. Um, the downside of that was that it made it very hard for anyone to buy a ticket to see my show. So, <laughs> <laughs> there was that. <laughs> It, it's such a bizarre time in terms of live events now coming out of COVID. Um, I mean, not to put into words that I share the same background or the lengths that you've gone to to create the material that you have, but uh, in a similar context, when I was still wrestling, we had one a championship belt in January of 2020 and by March the entire world was like goodbye and oh, yeah. every, everything just closed and yeah, yeah. And the, I guess the wrestling you've got to, you've got to be close to somebody when you wrestle as well I mean that would have yeah, been you know, a mean, big, big no no <laughs> yeah like and the thing with independent wrestling compared to the big time American wrestling is that our cloud uh, our crowds are you're quite right our crowds are very close to the ring and being in you know a, a pub or an rsl or a, a venue that has a limited capacity the the sound or noise is quite you know quite shocking as opposed to seeing it on television you see it live and you go wow this this sounds completely different but the idea of trying to do a live performance during covid was just you know it was unheard of. And what was even more strange was that we had just won a championship and now it's like, oh, well, we'll just sit at home and stare at this forever. But the only thing we could do creatively was that we used social media like everyone else did and perceived to create this idea that we kept turning up to venues and going, oh, no one's here. Well, we'll just keep, <laughs> we'll just keep our belts in. We were here. And we sort of Photoshop ourselves in at various venues going, oh, well, we're here. No one else was. Oh, well, I guess we'll keep the belt. But that was <laughs> literally all we could do. And in a similar context, it, it, you know, creating a, a live show and wanting to be intimate with the crowds like you are with your stand-up comedy was seemingly, you know, almost – it went from, yep, that's okay, to almost becoming – like this foreign, like, oh, don't, don't speak those words, intimate, <laughs> close crowds, you know, putting up the cross, throwing holy water on you, like, don't you dare <laughs> talk about those <laughs> banned words during COVID time. I mean, for the likes of everything that you've done, did you find post-COVID coming back and, and not only writing and, and directing and emceeing, but as a performer, did you, did you find that there was a hard sort of uh, almost like, well, I know when people step away from a certain thing, there's that terminology of, oh, it's like riding a bike. I'll, I'll just 
I have a break, but then I start getting into it again. I start remembering it again. For the likes of yourself coming back post-COVID and doing live performances again, did you have that initial struggle to go, what did I do again? Is this? Am I doing the right thing? Did you have any of those hurdles coming back or was it all very much like, oh, yes, this again. Okay, I've got it. Yeah, no, I was like that. I was like, oh, yeah, this again. I've got it. I, I'm, I'm luckily pretty – pretty okay with that because my career has been kind of a, a bit haphazard and patchy and I've sort of, you know, I might've done a live show and then taken a few years of not doing live shows. Um, so I, that's okay for me, LJ, I found. I, I didn't yeah. have that, that sort of dizzying experience that I have heard some performers say, well, oh, I'm not used to it. I feel very rusty. Um, I mean, I feel a little bit rusty and, and it's definitely true that if you <clears throat> do a, a lot of shows back to back, you, you do, get match fit and Mm. you know your chops become a little bit better but um i didn't feel completely at a loss no no i mean i mean that's remarkable and that's a credit to yourself being such an esteemed performer maybe maybe. or it could just be blind luck or or just pig pig pig-headed stubbornness (laughs) Just, just the want to get out there and validated by strangers. Yeah, it could be like I don't care what people think of this show. It could be rubbish. I don't care. I'll, I'll get out on the stage anyway. <laughs> so please get down from the bus. Come on, come see my show. Yeah. Okay, so I do want to get into the the meat of your uh, illustrious career thus All far. Right. Um, Let's get meaty. <laughs> well, that's our time. Um, so, uh, so going, let's take it all the way back. So we've tarantined it. We've gone from where we are now. Let's take it all the way back. Let's rewind the hands of time to 1996. Now, you starred in a documentary called Uni with one of your fellow chaser mates, Charles. Doing that documentary, was there ever a conversation at that point of the origins of what the world has come to know as the chaser? Or was that just a very random you know, university style documentary with a couple of your mates. Was there any origins of the chaser then, or was this sort of your first time on camera, if you will? Well, that was, yeah, I suppose it was first time on camera, but not as a performer, you know, but as the subject of this documentary, which was kind of, it was made by this filmmaker called Simon Tarjay, mm-hmm. and um, who, who later we turned into, or I turned into a sort of comic character on the radio, and mm-hmm. and, and then he ended up, on screen in CNN and then with me, me being this British reporter. But I've always felt with that documentary, I'm not sure, I, I never felt comfortable later about the way it was made really because, I mean, for one thing, we were often drunk you know, on, <laughs> on camera, so it didn't really represent the real us, you know. Mm-hmm. So, so Charles Firth and, and me, we were, we were often pissed. And, and the reason we were often drunk was because the filmmaker himself, Simon Tarjay, would often turn up with booze to the shoot. <laughs> So, so I don't know, you know, in terms of sort of, I don't, I'm not sure what the ethical territory is there for a, for a factual filmmaker to do that, to go sort of turn up with his young, young booze hungry students and say, here you go, <laughs> here, here you go, fam. I was like, look, I brought you some, I brought you these lovely red wines. Why don't we start with those and then I'll turn on the camera? <laughs> you know, so, in that context, geez. Well, in that context, I mean, it changes the, the nature of, that documentary, I think, if you watch it knowing just how pissed we were in most of the shots. So we were we were very unguarded and saying things that we probably wouldn't have said sober. <laughs> <laughs> and and so I'm not sure it's the most realistic portrait of, of what we were. Mm. Um, but it was, there, there were sort of, I mean, we didn't discuss The Chaser at that time. I think that The Chaser brand name was thought up by Charles Firth. Uh, about three years later, I think, mm-hmm. um, you know, where he conceived of it as a funny newspaper or a kind of humorous newspaper that was, I mean, there was already, a, you know, various humorous newspapers in in the UK and the US had, had one called The Onion, which they, you know, is, is still exists as well. And Charles wanted an Aussie version of that, really. So <clears throat> he thought of the name The Chaser because it was based on the idea, well, again, it's a booze-related idea, um, that after you've, you know, a chaser is a drink that you have after you've had your big drink. So, mm-hmm. isn't it? It's a beer. I think it's a beer that you have after you've had your spirits or something, isn't it? And so, you know, Charles thought, well, this is the the news that you consume after you've read the main news. It's the chaser <laughs> that, that you follow your main news with. That was his, his 
his idea. So, and which is why the logo of the chaser is a, a shot glass or a beer. No, what is it? A beer glass. I always get confused as to whether it's the oh, shot drunk. or the beer. He's drunk. <laughs> yeah, I'm t- I, yeah, that's right. I should have mentioned Simon Tajay was here earlier and I'm pissed as a newt <laughs> before this um, podcast. <laughs> so, um, but I did meet Craig Rucastle and, you know, and Charles Firth while that, you know, I, they were friends of mine while that uni documentary was being made. And um, uh, we would we were making live comedy shows, which were the reviews, which the uni I went to, was, I was lucky enough that they had faculty reviews, <clears throat> being, uh, reviews as in sketch shows. Mm-hmm. So the arts faculty, which Charles and Craig and I were in, uh, it it had never had a review before, strangely enough. Like there, there was a, every year there'd been a law review and an engineering review, but the one faculty that should have had a comedy show, you would have thought, would be arts. Mm-hmm. And uh, Charles, being a real mover and shaker type of guy, he started the first arts review. He was able to find some funding for it and and produce it, and um, that was the first ever arts review that was. That was done, and I think uh, you know. So I owe a lot to that time, really, for because it it meant I could kind of fall in with these people, and then um, <clears throat> you know I ended up writing and performing a, a lot of the the first couple of arts review shows, and uh, and Chris Taylor came and watched one of them, mm-hmm. which is how Chris sort of discovered my existence, and then uh, you know <laughs> later later Chris and I were brought together by Charles to to film some homemade prank that somebody had dreamed up. Um, And so, yeah, so, you know, that was kind of the beginning of how how some of us got together. Well, I mean, if we jump forward uh, six years in time, so we go from 996 to 2002, this was, for me, as a a viewer and a fan, uh, this is the first incarnation of what would famously be known as CNN and N. Now... Would it be correct in the assumption of this was the first time that all of you guys came together and this was maybe the birth of what we would later come to know as the Chasers War and everything, which is the most, I think, arguably the most popular incarnation of the Chasers TV-wise. But the CNN and N, is this the first time that all of you guys got together and went, you know, he's writing a newspaper parody article website if you will is there a possibility here to do a television show and the answer is looking back in hindsight yes there is but for you at that time how pivotal was doing the cnn and then show and was there ever a conversation or maybe even a thought process of are we doing the right thing here or is this were you just sort of flying off the seat of your pants and a lot of things were going, yeah, come and, come on through, and you're going, oh, wow, this is actually happening. So was there any sort of hurdles with that or was this all sort of, wow, we're getting a lot of yeses here and like, okay, I guess we'll make a TV show now? Yeah, it was like that, LJ. It was very oh, strange. Wow. We, were, we were very lucky, I suppose. I mean, you know, I was very lucky really to have fallen in with that group because, you know, I didn't do any moving and shaking Charles like I said Charles Firth was the mover shaker person really and yeah I mean CNN and N was a was a huge break which which I didn't realize at the time because um I mean I was super unhappy really for about a decade and uh so I was really just trying to avoid being unhappy I wasn't ambitious and I've never really been hugely ambitious I've always mm-hmm. mostly been driven by just trying to avoid pain and suffering that's that's kind of my my mode my modus operandi and it was back at that time too um I mean we had you know as a group the chaser after the newspaper started uh there were a, a couple of lucky opportunities which some of the chaser people had um, some of the before CNN and N, there was a bit of radio. So uh, we did some late night radio comedy on Triple M, and uh, and even actually, I think even Mike Carlton's radio show in Sydney had some of the guys making sketches on it for a little while uh, because Mike Carlton was interested. Um, but the big the big break came, I think, when Andrew Denton got interested in the Chaser newspaper because Andrew Denton was a subscriber. I mean, he he was one of the people what? who subscribed. Yeah, he subscribed to the Chaser newspaper. And then and it was him that, who got in touch, really. So it was very fortunate too because at that time, 
Andrew Denton was <clears throat> uh, much in demand, especially on the ABC. The ABC executives of that day, uh, they were in love with Andrew. And, you know, there were he was, a lot of doors were opening for him. I mean, he could almost do, you know, he could propose almost anything to the ABC and they'd say yes. You know, and, and some people are lucky enough to go through <clears throat> a brief period where that's the case for them. Um, well, actually, I think for about the last 15 years, that person's been Sean McAuliffe. <laughs> he's, yes. I think he, he's had a lot of yeses from many ABC executives, um, probably deservedly so because he's very good. But, and, but Andrew was getting a lot of yeses, and he he contacted the Chaser newspaper folks and said, hey, do you want to try making a TV show? And most of them weren't really performers. They were writers. Um, mm. So they got together with Andrew, and he produced – a 2001 TV series called The Election Chaser, which mm -hmm. was, you know, just four episodes about the federal election that year, a comedy right. show, um, which I wasn't involved in. I was busy desperately trying to be a musician and trying to stop my life running off the rails. And uh, and it was it was the following year. Luckily, I joined. Well, the the guys asked me, thank goodness, because they 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 liked me and they knew me and they'd, they'd worked with me on you know, some of the sketch shows at uni. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, you know, we, we'd like to get someone in the group who can actually perform and deliver a line of dialogue properly, no which pressure. was me, because <laughs> you know, none, none, none of them really could. And, well, they sort of could. They could bumble through, I suppose. Um, so I said, yeah, sure. Um, but it wasn't really, like I said, yeah, it was a bit like that. I said, oh, yeah, okay, sure. And I didn't really realise um, at the time, you know, how rare it an opportunity it was to have a writer performer job on TV in Australia. I didn't really take it seriously. <laughs> I just thought, oh yeah, this will be this will be fun to do for a little while before I figure out what to actually do with my life. Yeah, I mean, I think there was such a strange time in the early two thousands for Australian television because we had the Sydney Olympics, and it was like, wow, Sydney exists. Look at us, the world. And then you kind of go back to regular life and you go, well, now what do we have on television? And they had Neighbours and Home and Away and, you know, you had people coming up through that. But in terms of comedy, um, I mean, I don't even think Rove was a thing. I mean, you had Hamish and Andy doing the Melbourne community radio and television, I guess Rove and Peter Hellier and things like that. But there wasn't really, you know, a, a week by week comedy staple if you will i mean there was you know the one-off yeah. specials and things like that i think maybe backburner was the was the thing before us or maybe i think it might have been oh, that with peter oh, I, think, I think you're forgetting the australian television comedy gold of australia's funniest phone videos there andrew oh and that, and that too <laughs> there was definitely that boing, <laughs> was the sound effects weren't there when the, when the guy got kicked in the testes boing. <laughs> I mean, a lot of dads being kicked in the balls. You you watch that footage without the sound effects, and it's actually quite like this is very dangerous. Like, yeah. all right, I'm going to fix the roof tile, and the ladder falls, and this guy almost comes crashing down to earth <laughs> near, near death. And you go boing, like this Looney Tune sound. Like that's all, folks. And this guy's going my spine. Oh, oh, what a silly bugger! And it's like I can't walk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we didn't think we were a harsher people back then. There was not much empathy in society back then. Not like now, where there's kind of too much empathy, and you know you're not allowed to see anybody having even the slightest bad time now, or it's very problematic. So CNN then was the arrival, if you will, of the chases on Australian television at that time. I remember seeing in the TV guide that it was slotted at various time slots. There was sort of peak hours or there was like 10 p.m. or sometimes it was 8. It kind of varied. And as you said, it was, you know, the rise of Andrew Denson's new production company and you guys were sort of coming on and then sort of, it was almost like an experimental process, if you will. But if we jump two years later, you get to the chase of the sides. Now, this, I think, was the first incarnation of what The Chaser became popular and I would argue was the origins of revealing that the politicians and everything that's happening in our country, let alone the world at that time, was so bizarre. And these these sort of, you know, off the cuff promises that every politician makes, like, ah, oh, free beer for everyone after ten AM, but I work in a childcare. All right, eleven AM. Uh, I swear if you vote me in, did you get there, they go, Oh, tax on alcohol. 
what? That's not what you promised. Like all these ludicrous like <laughs> claims. And I do want to say, like, if it wasn't for you, for the guys like yourself, I mean, two thousand four was very sort of a strange time coming after the, you know those horrific terrorist incidents. So everyone was sort of on edge, going, "Can we make fun of everything? You know, is, is this allowed?" But the fact that you guys sort of went, "No, I think this is the perfect time," because everyone needs a laugh and everyone needs to sort of parody the fact that. Everything is just a bit topsy turvy. I mean, you yourself being in that time period of 2004 with Chase of the Sides, was this sort of the time for you guys sitting down and coming off the back of CNN and going, okay, so the television thing worked? Was there ever a process now where you went, okay, so what do we do now? We've we've kind of parodied Fox News for you guys creating the Chase of the Sides. How difficult was that whole process for you guys in regards to not only not only it making sense, I mean, I guess the material you had to work from with the Australian politicians was coming in almost JK Rowling, Harry Potter style. It was just reams and reams of paper of these sort of insane quotes and situations these guys are finding themselves in. But was there ever a pressure on yourself or any of the guys in that group coming into the chase of the sides and how is this too much? Are we doing the right thing here? Like, how how was the chase of the sides process for, for all you guys at that point? Yeah, no, I I know what you mean. It was a bit, um, you know, there was a lot to think about, and and the the format was was very similar to the two thousand and one short series that that the other guys had done that I wasn't involved in, which was mm-hmm. called the Election Chaser, and it was it was a similar kind of format. That the idea was it was set. Uh, kind of in the in the tally room and it was a parody of an election broadcast but it it ran for you know five weeks instead of just being election night only mm-hmm. uh so so partly it was a parody show i guess it was a form parody partly was was the decision you know let's let's parody the um the kinds of things that election night coverage does so that the maps and the graphs and that you could have some fun you know sort of parodying those things and and turning them on their heads and on top of the form you've also got the material as you said the crazy stuff that the politicians were actually doing uh, and and a lot of that was research i mean i i think the the toughest thing was actually um you know making comedy out of factual information is a lot of work mm. it, it does require you to have a team of really good researchers <clears throat> and also for for us the writers to be across uh, huge amounts of media, you know, because we mm. so we had all these machines set up to record because you need the clips as well. If you're going to make fun of what's happening in the in the media, you need to show it. So mm. we re- you need to record hours and hours and hours of stuff from all of the channels, news programs and current affairs programs and the breakfast TV shows. Uh, so it was a good training ground for for what we later did you know in our other tv shows where we we did do make a lot of comedy out of clips and that but there was a real specialty of Chaz in particular who's you know <clears throat> a bit sort of on the spectrum when it comes to this stuff he's he's becomes obsessional about collecting as many clips as possible and and sitting there all day and night to review them all and you know y- you need to have a some some sort of comic sensibility then so that you can identify the bits to pick out that you can make fun of and weave a a, a narrative out of so i th- i think for, yeah for me that was probably the hardest part of the whole thing was that <clears throat> making it research based uh you know <laughs> making comedy out of what's really going on in the world uh and uh, you know the other thing i guess was for me to kind of weasel my way onto screen a bit more i was <laughs> oh, yeah i was i was thinking you know in seeing in and in I was a I was a writing for CNN and N, and I was occasionally on screen, and so I had to have this I had this huge conversation because I thought I would, I may as well be used. You know, I felt like at that time I wasn't a very good writer at that time at all. I was very green, and I barely knew how to write a sketch really. Mm-hmm. Um, but I I thought I I can deliver a line and I can play silly characters. So so I had this long chat to the other guys about well you know maybe I could be on the panel in in the chaser decides casting you know when when we cast this show and uh, mercifully they agreed um, <laughs> so there was so that that's how I ended up on the desk <laughs> in, yeah. and and the other big thing for us was parting ways with Andrew Denton actually because you know he had been the executive producer of CNN and N for two mm-hmm. seasons and and then we we didn't work together on you know after that um 
you know, we, th we, we, we sort of said, oh, we'd like to just do that ourselves now. We'd like to, you know, produce our own stuff instead of answering to another creative mm. um, who was older than us and had had more experience. And, you know, we, we thought, but, you know, we, how, how much longer can we really do that? How much longer can Andrew be our boss? Mm. <laughs> and we, we thought, no longer, no longer than two <laughs> seasons. We want to do it ourselves, and, mm. and which luckily the ABC were at the time were were happy with. Um, but as you say, I guess the other thing is is you know politics. Sure, it, it it was going a bit crazy at that time, but nowhere near as crazy as it later became. I mean, I feel like nowadays I've kind of lost interest in doing any sort of topical or comedy or or comedy about what's going on in politics because it's it's so mental now. It's so bonkers. Um, it's not, you know, it's very hard to to go further than the reality um, is partly why, and and partly it's it's a bit depressing. I find that these days, if you with an audience, if you just raise the subject of what's going on in the news or in the world, it's a bit of a downer, you know. Mm. And then you've got to build them back up from from going, oh, you know, everyone goes, oh, now if you mention what's going on in the world because it's so awful, so so I just don't. I, I don't do it anymore. So I think the world has changed as well since the uh, 2004 series. I think, like, it's such a society pivotal switch. I mean, when politicians seemingly got outed for all their craziness from, you know, the likes of you, of yourself and all the Chaser boys um, representing, you know, the craziness that was Australian politics at that time. And nowadays, more commonly, I mean, the fact that seemingly – America almost trolled themselves and went, yeah, let's put Donald Trump in. Let's see what he can do. And then you went, oh, he's insane. And yeah. and, and you're quite accurate in, in your viewpoint, which is how do you write comedy about a guy that literally mucks up his own Twitter feed and yeah. yells, at, yells at, you know, people, you know, that are going, how's your day been? Fake news. Oh, well, we can't really make a joke because this guy's sort of – stealing our material if you will like you, how do you parody yeah. a guy that's literally a parody but no. going before all that came about before we had these you know ridiculous political figureheads if you will you, you touch briefly on writing things of a political nature and how do you make it funny now we get to the chapter may have put you guys if not already on the map uh, definitely on the map of uh, not only australia but the world we get to now 2006 the chasers war on everything so this version of the chaser that you now are doing would you say it was more a modernized version of say CNN and N, the chase of the Zides. You, you, you were still doing political things. There was lots of moments there where you were sort of tracking down John Howard and various members of the of the of the uh, parliament parliamentary team at that time. But you were now also sort of making fun of, I guess, Australian society and, and to some extent sometimes the global society, given like how bizarre and weird it was being. When you guys sat down for that initial sort of creative meeting, what was the thought process as to well, how far can we take it, and is it better to just apologise than to ask permission? <laughs> yeah, that that it kind of was that. It was because you know we felt I think that um, we wanted to to do jokes about more subjects, I guess, than what was possible to cover on in the CNN and in format. I suppose. I mean, it, it was sort of and to and to have a more relaxed format. We thought, well, let, let's drop the parody. You know, okay, so we've pretended to be a, a news network. Uh, why don't we do a more casual feel format where it's just us, but us in mm -hmm. inverted commas, or you know, mm -hmm. versions of ourselves, yeah. basically sitting around in a lounge room <laughs> yeah. and presenting <laughs> presenting things that could be about anything at all. I mean, any subject. So, yeah, we you know we because we were itching to do broader stuff, or particularly Chris Taylor and and I wanted you know we we liked writing sketches about you know to parody hollywood movies or or just put a or come up with a silly character and put him out in the street like the crazy warehouse guy who oh. was you know he was just <laughs> yeah. based on those these late night tv commercials which i think were unique to australia um you know where there were always these Persian rug warehouses and they were always <laughs> yeah. having cl closing down sales for some reason. And there was a great urgency for behind the, the voiceover, so much so that he would shout, you know, the, and, and 
these ads are always on after about 10 or 11 p.m., you know. It's closing down. <laughs> <laughs> it's not tonight because the boss has gone crazy. Uh, the boss had always gone crazy. <laughs> the, the motivator behind these sales was the was the mental health of the boss, or what? And um, so you know, we we wanted to make fun of things like that. Um, you know, <laughs> um, which we could do to a degree with CNN. And I mean, the, the nice thing about the CNN format was we had that we could come up with these pretend channels on the cable network mm -hmm. and you know we could advertise pretend shows that were on the science fiction channel or the, the history channel so that that was a little bit of a, a window that cnn gave us into writing sketches that that weren't about what was going on in the world but were more about cultural things uh, you know, or, or anything at all. I mean, I, you know, I, I wrote a sketch for The Chaser's War and everything about a, one of those annoying people in restaurants who takes pride in ordering something unusual on the menu <laughs> to, to yeah. show off to everybody else what an adventurous diner they are. Mm. Uh, and, and so uh, we had this movie trailer called The Adventurous Diner. <laughs> I mean, things like that. It, it, it just broadened the canvas and somebody had the, the genius idea to call it war on everything which was that was a timely title back then because mm. um, americans and a lot of conservatives were always talking about the war on something or other there was a lot of talk about the war on drugs and the war on christmas and the, you know the, <laughs> the, the war on jesus and things you know people, people there was always a war on something mm. uh the war on decency you know so uh, that title i can't, re can't remember who came up with that the, the title war and everything. It wasn't me, but I remember being quite full of admiration for <laughs> whoever it was that came up with it. Because, <laughs> you know, there's only a four-year gap here from CNN and to the war and everything. But I think probably post, um, maybe even around, you know, just just probably maybe after CNN had just stopped, that's when the most popular one at that time, popular, if it's, you know, like a, like it's, like it's a good thing, but the one that was sort of being thrown around a lot was the war on terror. It was the war on terror. was the war on terror was a, was a big one. Yes. Which, which we'd kind of dealt with too on CNN and in a, a lot. Mm. And um, well, and, and I think the, the series before that, that the other guys did that I wasn't involved in the, the, the election chaser, that mm -hmm. that, that was, I mean, that was broadcast in 2001, which was, you know, the, the year of, of September 11. So, mm. so they, they had, that had been, been in the air. We kind of wanted to move on to something else. Actually, the other thing that prompted it was we, we toured in 2005. Uh, we, you know, we toured this sketch show called uh, Cirque du Chaser, which was based, you know, because Cirque du Soleil was huge at that time. And we thought, well, well maybe we'll s sell some more tickets if we call it after something <laughs> that was really popular. And we called it Cirque du Chaser. And in Cirque du Chaser, we, you know, that, that, that show was just full of silly sketches about anything and everything. Mm. And I think that that live show that we did gave us some confidence that maybe we could do a TV show in a similar vein. It pushed the envelope, but in all the right ways. For people that grew up with Australian comedy, there was inklings there, maybe even influences from, you know, sketched comedy shows that used to push the envelope, one of which being Full Frontal. Like the, the amount of skits and things they used to do of the ads and commercials and, and paying out the news and everything like that of that time, this was almost a, a rebirth or a modernization of that with, with you guys taking pot shots at just the insanity of just the world at that time. But for yourself, when you were when you were creating the Chasers War and everything, and these characters that you had come up with, if you could pick a version of yourself, be it a character or or something that you did in the on the couch set, which one would you preferably have chosen to do? Like if someone, okay, let's say from today, someone came to you and said, "Hey, we're doing a Chaser Best of." If there was a modernized version of a certain character that you had done. Which one would you have picked to, you know, sort of almost do like a "Where Are They Now?" or a skit featuring that character uh, today? Oh, that's an interesting idea. Uh, you mean like, well, I mean, I had these sort of regular characters. I mean, do you mean like some of the characters, like the surprise Spruker or Clive, the slightly too learned commuter? <laughs> okay. The, 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 yeah. Sorts, like, is that what you mean, like the? those silly characters I took out into public places and... I mean, I, I think for me, I, I do know for a fact 
live was <laughs> something that you'd prefer not to do. But oh, I, it was I, horrible. I, yeah, no, doing, yeah. doing, yes, but yeah, this character who would have embarrassing, loud conversations yeah. on his mobile on the train, and and which is it was traumatic to film. It really was, LJ. It was, you know, because I'm not a <laughs> confrontational guy, really. Um, so it was very embarrassing to shoot those things. Yeah, although I, I think it's funny. I mean, it's a, it's a funny sort of sketch. I, I guess the problem with some of that these days is that because of the internet and mm. you, YouTubers, and there's a lot of YouTube pranksters who've sort of yeah. gone on to do very similar stuff to mm. what we were doing um, in the mid 2000s. So I, I feel like if you know if we went out and did Clive the slightly too low commuter today. It wouldn't be as original or, mm. you know, unusual, I guess. Whereas when we were doing it, I think in Australia anyway, it was a bit new, you know, to be doing that. But within a couple of years, YouTube really took off. And I, and I saw, you know, I, I noticed, oh, oh, look on YouTube, there are some people bursting into song in public places, which was, <laughs> you know, just, just what we would, were doing a couple of years earlier yeah. <laughs> in a segment called If Life Were a Musical. Yeah, so it's bunny, it would be hard to know what to do today. I feel like today, if I was going to do it, it, it would be much more sketches. Mm -hmm. and I'd probably pull back on on the pranks, or, or or only do the pranks if they were really, I, I think, if they were meaningful and had a satirical point. I guess we we used to sometimes ask that, and I wasn't huge. I didn't think that everything needed a satirical point, but um, uh, Julian Morrow was always very keen on the idea that. Everything we did should have a satirical point or some some, <laughs> yeah. some kind of mess, some kind of deeper underlying reason to do it. And sometimes some of our stuff did. I think I was more of the school of thought that it was good to have some of that in the show to give it a bit of fiber, or what Andrew Denton used to call fiber in the show, fiber. so that it's not just white bread. You know, mm. have, have something a bit of goodness in there for the audience. To, <laughs> it's not you're not just eating. Or where, what was the other one? Um, Craig Craig Rucastle once uh, he he described our second live show to me as being like very funny and everything, but it's a bit like just eating a bag of lollies, and afterwards you go, oh, ooh, that was very sweet and sugary, and I wish it had had some some fiber in it, I guess, or <laughs> some veggies. I okay, full full admission here. The chasers more and everything came out when I was in grade 11 so heading into grade 12 and i will confess to you and to all the people here that there was a point in time when the crazy warehouse guy skit had come out where you had gone down to sydney harbour and there was a bunch of tourists and you had said you look like people who have just been imported direct <laughs> and then you're that like trying to take line. photos they're trying to take photos of them and you're like saying all right on the count of three say massively reduced and they're just like i don't know what you're talking about say <laughs> bargains and this one girl goes bargains <laughs> yeah, she did yeah yeah they were pretty good those tourists that actually uh you know participating <laughs> just to, to whatever degree they could um <laughs> It was, um, well, the bafflement was always a, a part of the humour, I think, of those pranks. And um, so it, it, it's, I think it struck me that I think that might, that particular one might, may have been my idea to go and, you know, take the crazy warehouse guy to some overseas tourists. Or it might have been Chris Taylor's idea. It's the sort of idea he would have because they'd be even <laughs> more baffled. You know, I mean, Australian <laughs> residents were pretty baffled by the warehouse guy, but, uh, you know, people who were, literally from overseas and just looking around Sydney for the day. <laughs> it seemed funny. It was a very funny idea to go and confuse them with this loud shouting character. <laughs> because the warehouse guy was a parody of, you know, this strange shouting guy that said, you know, discount Harry Potter merchandise, seven dollars, once a plenty. <laughs> You're going, what? And it's always in some sort of shed or some sort of back alley, like, go down to this warehouse, ask for Bob, he'll take you to the third brick on the right. That's right, third brick on the right. Don't ask any questions. And you're like, huh? Like, and it was always in this weird ad, like it was sort of like, make sure you've got a mortgage out in your house. That's right, mortgage, you're never going home. It's like, huh? Hang on. But for yourself, because cause they were so similar, did you feel a certain sense of security or that sort of invisible barrier when you're portraying a character? It almost feels like a, a almost like a cloak or or a sense of, you know, this alternate persona. Like, would you say the crazy warehouse guy? You felt a bit more 
confident doing that because it was already based on on an idea that was established as opposed to Clive. Because they're very similar, you know, out in public yelling about things. But I guess the warehouse guy had that sort of already preset ideology and then perception of himself. So comparing the two, was the warehouse guy a bit more for lack of a better term, secure playing that character as opposed to Clyde because there was already a preset notion of who that p- persona was? That's a really interesting, really interesting question. I mean, I think I, <clears throat> it didn't make me any less nervous, LJ, about, about you know, going out and causing scenes in public. I still, you know, it was still a little bit, yeah, it was still quite a frightening thing to do, probably on an equal level, but I think it made the writing of it easier Mm. Um, so the crazy warehouse guy and his and his very close relative, the surprise Spruger, who was also a salesperson. <laughs> you know, we had this bizarre thing where we had two different types of salespeople who were both very annoying and loud, um, with different voices. Uh, <laughs> I mean, those because those those were, as you say, they were pre-existing things. You know, we were we were sort of parodying a a form of of uh, dialogue that already existed. So it made the script writing easier. You know, um, we could sit around and it was huge fun writing those scripts as a group, I must say, because it, a lot of the stuff on the Chester's War and everything was the, 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 the writing process was one person or two of us. We'd either write something solo or, or in a pair with somebody else. Mm. It was very rare for us to write with any more than two of us a piece, and then we'd bring the piece to a writer's meeting where all five of us were in, and all, and then you know everybody would sort of chip in ideas. But a, but, but but the main body of every sketch was really written by one or two people. But the exception, I think, was probably the the surprise Spruker bits and the crazy warehouse guy bits. <laughs> I have very fond memories of all five of us just being in the office together and. You know, I, I'd i say, look, I'm trying to write a surprise spruker about this scenario, and all five people would pitch in, you know, with, with lines, just shouting them across the office. And that was, <laughs> that was glorious fun. So I would be typing down everybody's lines and then, you know, and then you'd pick the best and assemble them into a sort of a, a, a little narrative um, that made some sense. So, yeah, that, 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 that was a lovely co-writing exercise. There have been very few writers' rooms where all five... You know, where, where like five writers could really pitch in on a script <laughs> without, a, you know, descending into chaos and nightmarishness. All right, you guys, that does it for part one with Australian icon Andrew Hanson. Thank you again, Andrew, for coming in for part one. Hey, don't forget, he'll be back next week for part two. If you haven't done so already, please follow Little Man Big Conversations on all the social media networks, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll see you next week.